Hello and welcome to Faith Evolving. My name is Mary Claire and today we're going to be talking about how you can be an LGBTQ plus Christian. So right up front, I want to say, you know, I hope that this video softens some hearts, you know, plants some seeds, especially in those who really hold fast to a more exclusionary doctrine within Christianity. Yet I'm not too naive to expect the results of this video to be like all rainbows and butterflies, puns intended. So my target audience here is for people who have been hurt by the church's anti-gay teachings and for those who want to stop the cycle of hurt. With that being said up front, the format of this video is going to be I'm going to go through some church history of where some of these teachings came from, and then I'm going to go through some of the most used clobber passages used against LGBTQ plus people and kind of pick them apart, show alternative interpretations of them other than the ones used to like bully people. You're a cyber bully. And lastly, I'm going to talk about employing some queer theology so you yourself can seek, you know, healing from the same text that people have used to harm you if you want to do that sort of thing. So let's get into it. Church history time! Early Christianity, very different, very, very different than where we are now. Part of that is because there's been 2,000 years between. <laughs> quote-unquote homosexual acts were very present in ancient Greece and ancient Rome. They weren't normalized in the fact of like marriages, but it was a part of the culture. And this was in both consensual and non-consensual ways. In a lot of cases there were like statutory kind of dynamics in play where someone had power over the other person they're engaging in, you know, a sexual act with. Part of that is because the view of, you know, gay sex, especially between two men or people with traditionally male genitalia was, holy cow! I had no idea my AC unit was homophobic, but here we are. Anywho, the viewpoint of gay sex was that the person being penetrated was weaker than the person penetrating. And part of that is, you know, a reflection of a patriarchal kind of society of, you know, men being better than women and if you're being penetrated you're viewed as a woman and holy shit! I hope you can't hear that. You're just gonna have to deal with whatever rattling is going on. There were people known as eunuchs who were either lower servants or slaves oftentimes were castrated and they were, you know, available to the people who employed them or owned them. And so it was just something present in the culture that people knew about that would be, you know, in the forefront of people's minds when they're thinking about how to ethically engage with other people as they're trying to follow this Jesus revolutionary guy who died recently but had some sort of special zest to him that kept people coming back. Now, most of the records that we have of early Christianity, especially the stuff that, you know, made it into the biblical canon in like the New Testament were letters from Paul or people saying that they were Paul or people we just said Paul wrote it because we all love Paul. And there were two primary groups that were coming from different perspectives and point of views that these letters were for. People who were Jewish, such as, you know, Jesus was and a lot of his disciples who were around him, and then Gentiles, which were people who weren't Jewish, and those were just other people living in the Roman Empire at the time. You know, ancient history you learned in seventh grade, if you paid attention. Pay attention, seventh graders who probably aren't watching this. Pay attention. It's important if you're a religious person for all the context. But in both, you know, the Jewish traditions and the Gentile traditions and culture, family was really, really important. And these families tended to be patriarchal. You know, the father, the eldest man of the family is at the top and everyone else follows down below, you know, that whole umbrella of protection that's present in the IBLP situation. And these families kind of ran as mini businesses is the best way that I can put it. 
it was very formulaic everyone had their role they all contributed to like making the family function but also slaves were sometimes present in these families especially the wealthier the families were and sometimes slaves meant eunuchs but when they were writing these letters in the early christian church there wasn't an emphasis on longevity or even this idea of like building like an institutional religion because they all thought jesus was coming back to earth like really 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 soon letters of advice are basically how to build community and how to survive and that's kind of the essence of the early church then we get to the middle ages and this is when christianity is first institutionalized and this is because constantine converts to christianity and makes it the official religion right before rome falls and that initial big fall of the roman empire is what I'm referred to as the big setback that launches the Middle Ages, sometimes referred to as the Dark Ages, in what we now consider the region of Europe. And throughout the Middle Ages, the church was the center of power and influence, especially in regards to intellect. So if you recall in history, there's the burning of the Library of Alexandria. The wider population did not have access to literacy and books and all of these things or prior knowledge of the Greeks, the only way you really had access to that is if you were like a monk or a nun who dedicated your life just to studying. And so doctrine establishes over time, but it's over a period of about a thousand years. Ah! Where the church, like I said, is the central force of power and power tends to corrupt an absolute power. Wait, wait, corrupts absolutely. That's genius. Yes, I'm a theater kid. <laughs> so a focus on historical context isn't necessarily there. Sometimes people are more motivated by holding on to power. There's also a pretty significant deal of anti-Semitism in this time period of the Middle Ages. Think about like the Crusades where we're all fighting over the Holy Land. So we aren't learning about like the Jewish traditions and the way that they interpret some of our shared scripture. So we're just kind of making things up a little bit. Um, <laughs> so everything's just kind of up to these theologians who are very easily wrapped up in greed and a lust for power and corruption, which is gonna affect their writings and the way they tell everyone else what to do because <laughs> they have to listen to the church. And part of this, there's homophobia from the church down. Some of the most notable examples, we have Hildegard of Bingham, of Bingen, Bingham, Bingen. We got Hildy and she reports having a vision from God that being gay isn't okay. Men and women, no regard for anyone who's non-binary. But I don't know, this, this reminds me Girl Define even said, I have had an encounter with the Holy Spirit and I know God's heart on this. And that is so dangerous. Like, honestly, Hildegard. Why even call yourself a Christian? Then we've got Thomas Aquinas, our big old natural law fanatic, which natural law. Let me elaborate a little bit more on that. Natural law has been weaponized against especially people with intellectual disabilities as a way to other them as subhuman. This has also been the case for queer people as well as, you know, people who aren't white. It has a storied past of allowing social hierarchies that put people down and supporting oppressive structures. He linked heterosexuality to natural law. Like, that's the way of things. Sorry about it. Sorry about your luck. And within this time, like, offenders of all of this could be accused of witchcraft, you know, and then you're kaput. So now that we've set up the amount of power the church had, we get to the Reformation, where we've got Martin Luther. And he says, hey, can you maybe, can you maybe fix some things? Really? He accidentally says power to the people. He's trying to reform the Catholic Church and the people are like, hold up, wait a minute. And it kind of snowballed further than Luther uh, anticipated or probably wanted. But even with this influx of access to biblical writings because of the printing press 
and because we now have an English translation from King James, he might have had um, a little boyfriend on the side. So look at you, sister, King James. Hope the boyfriend wasn't underage. But as we know with the Reformation, then we get denomination upon denomination who have their own stories of who has rights, who doesn't, how they're influenced. The freaking Southern Baptist Convention still just trailing behind, just still not getting the memo effort. Sorry about it. Haha, -ha, I'm a real YouTuber because my camera died in the middle of recording. Anyway, this brings us to kind of leading up to where we are now. And we pick up with the plot of 1946, the movie documentary. But brief if you don't know the story, but in 1946, they were translating the ASV version of the Bible. It was like a big undertaking to really, you know, modernize the King James version. And in it, they combined two Greek terms, malakos and arsenokoite, that are both in the verses that we now have about homosexuality. A seminary student was looking at their, you know, little translators, <clears throat> so excited to take Greek. I was like, hey, this, mm, I don't know about all this, and sent a letter to the people who were translating things and they agreed with him, but the version had already gone out to the printers and it has snowballed into taking effect of these terrible things such as conversion therapy and LGBTQ plus youth harming themselves or you know, taking their own lives. But then we have Stonewall in the late 60s that spurs this movement of queer rights for people who are fighting to be able to be seen in the public and have their love be affirmed in the public and not have to hide who they are. But the church has just sort of dug its heels in instead of evaluating and uses the Bible as a weapon with a bunch of what we refer to as clobber passages. So the term clobber passage is from taking, you know, the things in the Bible and just beating people over the head with it to be like, you're wrong and you're terrible and you're going to hell. And it's not good. Some of these notable passages are ba -ba 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 -ba, as follows. We have Genesis 19, and this is the passage about Sodom and Gomorrah. The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out so that we can have sex with them. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, no, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men for they have come under the protection of my roof. Men inside, aka the angels, reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness so that they could not find the door. How it's used as a weapon is that they see the cities being destroyed as a result of people having homosexual behavior. However, the bomb, or the alternative viewing is that it was destroyed because there was gang going on. Also note that Lot didn't say, don't do it because they're men. He said, because they're under the protection of my roof, don't do this. And then he offered his daughters, which was not a pro gamer move. I'll say that. But the angels didn't allow him to do that. Everyone was protected from being sexually violated. And we could go into more of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and about, like, the wrath of God, but I'm just talking about mainly just how it's used against LGBTQ plus people. Then we have passages in Leviticus, or parts of the Mosaic Law. So we have Leviticus 18, 22. Do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. And the weapon is that this is the part of the Bible that most like clearly condemns homosexuality. And it's like really aggressive language. But the bomb is a lot of things. So it's technically only talking about men. Um, but that's kind of a weak bomb, you know, that still doesn't do anything for gay men or bi men or pan men. It's also unclear on like what 
acts are prohibited is another argument. I think that's also just kind of a weak argument. But I think the biggest one is there's a debate over if these laws apply to Christians at all. There are a lot of laws in Mosaic Law that we don't abide by. So why is homosexuality any different? Why is that one special? Well, people say because it appears also in the New Testament. But this is where the mistranslation really comes into play of those Greek words, malakos and arsenokoite. So in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And the weapon here is that gays will not inherit the kingdom of God, is what it says. But the balm is that in different translations, it says, sodomites, which if we refer back to the Sodom and Gomorrah story, that's about, you know, non-consensual acts. And also, the mistranslation of Malakos and Arsenokoite, it more closely translates to condemning the common practice at the time of pedastry, which is this institutionalized form of having sex with underage boys. Then we have 1 Timothy 1.10. For the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine. Weapon is similar to the one with 1 Corinthians is that you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And also they group in queer people with um, slave traders and they kind of equate the two is kind of what people gather from that. But the bomb is similar. It's actually, you know, with translation, more closely talking about condemning pedophilia. And other people argue that the pedophilia then followed by slave traders could also be condemning, you know, sex slave trading because that was also something that was wrapped up in all of that at that time. Then we have Jude 1, well, there's only one chapter in Jude, 6 through 7. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and their surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. And it again is referencing Sodom and Gomorrah, the weapon. There'll be hellfire for those who go for strange flesh. Big Judge Claude Frollo moment. Hellfire. Balm is this passage isn't about queerness at all. Even like anti-gay theologians will agree with that. You kind of, it's kind of a reach situation. Then there's some stuff in Romans 1. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty of their error. The weapon here is that it's the only passage that like more openly or clearly talks about lesbians are a no-go or, you know, by women. Again, no, not even a thought of non-binary people in any of this. And the thing is, there isn't much pedastry amongst women. Like that wasn't as much of a commonplace of that power dynamic. However, there was some pretty institutionalized prostitution. And so the balm is, is that it could be referring to that in the non-consensual parts of it because Prostitution at the time, prostitutes were usually slaves or recently freed enslaved people. And a common place for, you know, prostitution to go down were the Roman baths. And this is a letter specifically to the Romans and the Roman baths were segregated. So that implies that, you know, there could have been not heterosexual things happening. But because the sex workers were usually like slaves or recently freed people. The lines were kind of blurred between forced prostitution and elected prostitution. Likely there was a lot of non-consensual things happening there. And if when in the letters, when they're referring to more um, like male sexual acts, that there was a specific behavior in mind, with female acts, there's likely a specific behavior in mind. 
Note here that all of this is mainly talking about sex and not like romantic love at all. I think that's something that we should really think about. And almost all of it in these readings are about non-consensual things. So keep that in mind when people come at you ready to whack you with their Bible. Another one is, you know, Genesis 1 through 3 with Adam and Eve, the whole it's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, which is used against um, queer people and their sexuality, as well as queer people and their like gender identity and non-binary people. The bomb is that maybe this isn't going to go for people who take the Bible like literally and use a more literal interpretation, but the story of Adam and Eve is a parable, I think at least, and there are a lot of other theologians who think that it's a parable. So there's that. Also, there's no explicit mention of queerness at all. And I think the most compelling thing to mention here is that in Jewish teaching, this passage is not about there only being two genders because there is a view that there is a multitude of genders. The way that the grammar and the language was used when talking about male and female is very similar to other parts in scriptural writings when they're talking about near and far, young and old, east and west. And all of those things imply a range and they're also all kind of constructs. So why isn't gender also a range or a construct? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And lastly, with clobber passages, there will be people who will say in response to Jesus didn't say anything about homosexuality with, oh no, but Jesus said Jesus didn't say shit. Likely they will talk about Matthew 19 or Mark 10, which are effectively the same story where Jesus references Moses like mosaic law about, you know, marriage being between a man and a woman. And they'll take that and they'll run with it. The bomb is that passage is about divorce. That's what the header is. The religious leaders were asking Jesus a question, actively trying to trip him up and make him mess up and get him on account of blasphemy. So Jesus expertly quotes something and then uses it for a pro woman move of being like, hey, don't just divorce your wife, especially if she doesn't have anywhere to go because we've built this society. <laughs> nice. That would probably just like leave her on the streets for dead. Um, so don't just divorce her because you don't like her anymore because you'll ruin her life. So that's my list of clobber passages I have so far. I'm sure there are more, but that's that's my list. Now on to employing queer theologies, so you can be a little theologian yourself. Queer theology is an offshoot of queer theory, and queer theory is a type of cr critical theory. It's critical- th Wokeism. It's critical theory, looking through a queer lens, and kind of the whole point of it is to be like, what are norms? And that thing is normal, especially with um, sexuality and gender. But that's really like taking it down to its bare bones. So my big source for this part of the video is um, from a book, Queer Theology Beyond Apologetics. And at the beginning of the book, uh, they talk about different apologetic approaches. And apologetics is a form of theology that's focusing on defending the faith. And so queer theology is about, you know, like defending your sexuality within the faith. Some of those approaches are deconstructing the gender of God, saying God is non-binary or God is genderless. Representation and reinterpretation, this is really interesting. It's looking at Bible stories through a queer reading of them. Some notable examples are David and Jonathan having a little romance. It's very compelling if you read it. You're like, I feel like I'm reading Bible fan fiction. A trans reading of Joseph and the Technicolored Coat. So mind blowing to me. A romantic reading of Ruth and Naomi. Queering Bible stories is fascinating and so interesting. Another thing is Jesus good, Paul bad. <laughs> um, ignore everything Paul said, only focus on Jesus, which I'm not a huge fan of that theory. I'm not, I don't, I think Paul has some good stuff mainly. Um, 1 Corinthians 13 is gold. He was on fire with that one. Other things, the longevity of them, Paul, they aren't good. It's not, it wasn't your best work. And reminder, 
Paul isn't divine. And then another one is an idea that like gays aren't sinners. Uh, that's a very common one. One that I probably subscribe to of like, yeah, yeah, like being gay just straight up isn't a sin. But with apologetics as a whole, this like very intellectual philosophical approach can be taken to extremes. So in this book, they also talk about queer theologies to come. First up is Christology, which is basically just uh, studying Jesus Christ specifically and what we can glean from scripture. What I love about this is that Jesus can be viewed through so many different lenses. There's such a beauty in that, like Jesus can be seen as asexual very easily or gay or bi and the fact that John is often cited as the disciple whom Jesus loved or you know you could go a uh, Jesus Christ superstar around and think that he had an entanglement with Mary Magdalene. One great one that I gleaned from uh, this wonderful tweet is that like Jesus refers to themselves as mother hen and so they could very easily be seen as gender non-conforming. Fascinating stuff. I love it. But Christology at least the way they're talking about it in the book is focusing on like the embodiment of Christ and the humanity aspect of Christ and what we can glean from all that. Then we have original sin. Okay, this one I had to read over and over again to try to grasp it and I'm still not sure if I did, but original sin really came from Augustine. Basically this idea that everyone is born sinful um, because of Adam and Eve. And there's this theologian, Jeffrey Reese, who agrees with original sin, but says that it is that sin that causes us to rest in our identities so much, and that sin that causes people to try to put down queer people and that there is no norm, there is no category, I think is what he's trying to say. But I'm not sure. So correct me, please. And then we have ecclesiology, which is the study of churches. And it's this idea that all of the churches that are so concerned with getting it wrong and messing up and letting in queer people and then upsetting God are so concerned with self-preservation that they're not allowing themselves to rest in resurrection and hope and progress, which I think is really interesting. I think that's fascinating. So those are a bunch of different ways that you can look at Christianity and the Bible in queer affirming ways. And you can very, very easily be a gay Christian. You can read the Bible in a super homophobic way. Or I just showed you, you can read it in a bunch of different queer affirming ways with a bunch of different queer theologies that you can explore and gain wisdom from. And that's so cool and so much fun, I think, I don't know. So thank you all for watching. This has been a broad but as comprehensive as possible video about why being a LGBTQ plus Christian is okay. Um, being queer Christian is okay, and that we are all made in the image of the divine. So like, comment, subscribe, ring the notification bell, leave a comment below, um, fact checking me if you're a theologian or any certain things that I really missed or you'd love to hear expanded upon. Um, but I do ask if you are going to disagree with me or even if you are agreeing with me, don't call anyone names. Do not be hateful. If you, it just, I'll delete it. I will delete it. Just, I will delete it. So take out your little typey fingers and just type, type something a little bit nicer. Bye. <laughs>